Now, uh, we'll get rolling here, and uh, what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of nearshore and offshore fishing. Uh, my name is Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. Hubbard's Marina is over in Johns Pass, Madeira Beach. We do a lot of nearshore and offshore fishing trips uh, in the form of private fishing charters, party boat trips, a lot of different things. Uh, and we work with a lot of people that do inshore fishing, gator hunting, all of the above. Basically, if you want to get out in the water and do any sort of fishing or uh, anything resembling it, uh, we do it or we work with someone who does. So today we're going to focus on what we do the most, which is that near shore and offshore fishing. But we'll talk a little bit about inshore stuff too. Uh, it's up to you, honestly. What I like to try to do is make this more of a fishing conversation. Uh, I don't like to stand up here and talk at you. I like to talk with you. So hopefully you guys have some questions and uh, you can kind of lead the discussion where you guys would like. Now, I always like to first start out by defining nearshore and offshore fishing because everybody kind of has their own definition. And you re read one fishing report, it's one way. You read a different one, it's a different way. So my definition, at least the way I was brought up, is inshore fishing is kind of the back bay up to the beaches. Nearshore fishing is from the beach out to around 100 foot or 20 miles. And then offshore fishing is 100 foot 20 miles or beyond. So today we're gonna to focus on that near shore and offshore stuff, but we can always chat about some inshore stuff if you have a question about that too, and I'll try my best. But definitely near shore and offshore is where we're gonna focus and try to remain today. But don't be afraid to ask any questions as we get rolling into the seminar. Now, first things first, I always like to also start by talking about what's going on now and talking about what's coming up, and then from there, get into your questions. So what's going on now is we just on the back side of our red snapper season. So to me, it's a bittersweet time of year, mostly sweet after a very long, hot uh, few weeks, but uh, we are now slowing way down. So kids went back to school, uh, red snapper season concluded. So we go from running 339 hours every day and boatloads of people through the summer vacation to all of a sudden almost like a screeching halt. We go from 70, 80, 90, 100 percent capacity down to all of a sudden now we're running with 30, 40, 50 percent capacity. This coming Tuesday we have a 39 hour going out with like 16 people on it. So super light loads this time of year and great opportunities to get out there on the water and not have crowded boats and have plenty of elbow room, lots of one-on-one -on -one time with the captain and crew, and a little bit more uh, elbow room. So that's what's going on as far as our boats are concerned. As far as the fishing is concerned, now that red snapper season is closed, we're able to go offshore, deep water, and focus on some of those other species like gag grouper, red grouper, scamp grouper, uh, mangrove snapper, yellowtail snapper, vermilion snapper, porgies, almacos. There's a lot of other species out there. Triggerfish, for example, that are open right now that we're now able to really focus in on now that we're not chasing those red snapper during that short season. Now, uh, unique for this time of year, we're August, we're mid to late August here. Uh, unique for this time uh, is we're catching a lot of yellowtails. Uh, generally, we see some good yellowtail fishing through the summer, uh, and it is here. It is definitely all of a sudden the last week and a half, two weeks. We, ca we normally catch yellowtail all year, but you'll catch one or two here, one or two there. You hit a specific spot, you might be able to get a, a dozen or two. But the 39 hour that came in this morning had like 150 yellowtails. They, they are definitely thick right now offshore. So yellowtail fishing is going really good for us. Also mangrove snapper. This time of year, those mangrove snapper get really prolific and they get really, really aggressive and they're generally in high concentrations. Uh, they're spawning this time of year. So we see a lot of good numbers of mangrove snapper. Some really big ones, but a lot of good numbers. And with the numbers, we sometimes see smaller ones. So we could be fishing 200 foot of water still catching a few of those smaller mangroves, but the overall size is generally closer to three, four, five, six pounds. And we've been catching quite a few of them that are closer to that 
six, seven pound range and beyond. So a lot of nice mangroves, a lot of qual uh, quantity mangroves, and we've been seeing, like I said, a lot of yellowtails. Pelagic wise, we still got those blackfin tuna in the area. We catch blackfin tuna really almost all year round. We see a big push of them in the spring and fall with the kingfish. We see them really heavily uh, in the winter time in Florida in January and February around the moons. But we catch them through the summertime pretty consistently as well. Uh, we're seeing quite a few of them out right now. A few wahoo we caught and released to sailfish this past week. So you never know with those billfish. But generally spring and fall following those kingfish and the bait migration patterns is when we see a majority of those uh, those kingfish or excuse me sailfish in the area. But you can't catch them all summer. You just never know. So good time to have a flat line out. Cobia have shown up a little bit, but cobia are a, a little tough to catch in our area. Really, Gulf Y cobia have been a little bit tricky the last few years. So that's kind of what we're going on now. What we're looking forward to is uh, I wouldn't say we're looking forward to this, but Red Grouper is closing at the end of this uh, month, August 29th, Red Grouper closes. So we're really focused on trying to capitalize on those Red Grouper. On the back side of that, what we're looking forward to is cold fronts. Once those cold fronts start, it really gets things moving. Fish really get the gear. People oftentimes ask me, what's the best time of year to go fishing? The best time of year to go fishing is when you're available. If you're, if you're available, go fishing, go fishing. And a lot of people are like, well, I'm waiting for my buddy. Yeah, he's, he, he's having trouble getting off work. Go fishing by yourself. If you wait for your friends to go fishing, you're never gonna get to go fishing, or you're not gonna go fishing enough. So I always encourage people, if you're available, go fishing. Well, the moon phase isn't right, or this isn't right, or oh, this, this uh, barometric pressure is, is too high. If you get caught up in too many of those variables, again, you'll never go fishing. Uh, there's a lot of times where things really stack up to make it seem like we're not gonna catch fish and we go out there and we still have a really great trip. Fishing is not a science. You can learn some things that are gonna help kind of uh, give you a general educated guess whether fishing's gonna be good or fishing's gonna be bad. But even on those days where you think it's not gonna be that good, you can still have some really good periods of bites. Now, uh, before we go in any further, did everybody get a raffle ticket? I saw a few people who showed up that didn't get a raffle ticket. Uh, come on up if you have not got a raffle ticket. Uh, we'll hand you one of those. Now, keep in mind, as I was saying, like, uh, for example, a good example of that is uh, Salt Strong. Uh, they have this uh, program called, you have three people, right? Uh, they have this program called Smart Fishing Tides, and Smart Fishing Tides gives you, you already got one. <laughs> uh, uh, Smart Fishing Tides gives you a uh, one out of 10 score on each day. Uh, so it's really cool to kind of forecast uh, the next two weeks, uh, when is the best day to go fishing. They literally forecast it for you and give you a one out of 10 score on their Smart Fishing Tides <coughs> website. Uh, and anybody can access that. It was for members only, but I really pushed on them. I'm like, come on guys, you gotta, you gotta make this public. It's public now, but you gotta give them your email. So give them your email and you'll have access to the smartfishingtides.com website. And it'll give you two weeks. Uh, it's really inshore fishing focused though. It doesn't work offshore because it works based off titles, uh, title uh, locations. So, you pick your tide location. Obviously for me, I'm looking at John's Pass a lot, and it will give you, based on that tide station, the best day, the next, basically, I think it's like 10 or 12 days, one out of 10 score. But even a day that has a, a five out of 10 score, a low scoring day, if you open it up, it'll show you wh what the tide's doing, and oftentimes on the major, even on a day, you're not really supposed to catch a lot of fish because other things, other variables are stopping you. There'll still be a nine out of 10 uh, hour or two or three hour period, even on that slower day. So all that to say, there's really not one day that's gonna be the best day to go fishing. Every day is a good day to go. You just gotta kind of keep trying, keep learning techniques and practice makes perfect. And the tougher days, in my opinion, teach you more uh, and really make you a better fisherman, better fisherman or fisherwoman overall 
because you're learning how to overcome that tougher bite and really persevering. <laughs> and it keeps you coming back, let me tell you. So um, as I was saying, what I was building up to is cold front start, really exciting time of year. People ask, what's the best time of year, best time to go fishing? One of my favorite times is that early to mid-October time frame, really almost the whole month of October. Right before the cold fronts start, you're on the backside of summer, things are starting to move around, days are getting shorter, then the cold fronts start, fish really start moving around, and then once a, cold, a couple cold fronts have moved through, uh, you've got a first big, strong, hardened down the front, then those gags pour in, and you get a lot of overlap. The summertime pattern is still kind of going on. That wintertime pattern is beginning and a lot of fish are kind of crossing over each other. For example, once we get those hardened down fronts going through pretty good, gags, a bunch of the female gags will come inshore into the bay and along our coast to feed on the plentiful bait that just hatched. Right now, that's what's going on. We have what's called fry bait in the area. A bunch of those little tiny green bats, glass minnows, little baby uh, uh, thread fins, they're all getting born in the bay right now, and they're all in big, massive clouds. And in a month or two, they start migrating out into the Gulf. And those female gag grouper come in close once it starts getting cold to gorge themselves on those baits before they make their big, big migration to their spawning aggregation sites in deep, deep water. So this is a great time of year or that is a great time of year once those cold fronts start to take advantage of those gag grouper coming in close and getting in high concentrations. And they're typically super aggressive. Then also, hogfish. That time of year, once those cold fronts start, they concentrate the hogfish and they get them up on the ledges. They're in higher numbers. The water gets murky because of the cold front and they generally are less leader shy and more aggressive. There's not as many divers in the water shooting them so generally cooler months are really good for hogfish like october-ish through like march april so gags pick up hogfish picks up also month of october generally the the the, the, the full moon at the end of september early october is where we really see those kingfish and mackerel show up too so that's why i really like october and the same holds true for like may april-ish may you're on the back side of winter and uh, you're, you're starting those summertime patterns. To me in Florida, we've got summer, and we've got winter, and we've got these transitional periods. We don't really have a spring or fall, but you have those transition periods where those summertime patterns and wintertime patterns kind of uh, coincide with each other. And those are my favorite times to really go fishing uh, because you get to take advantage of that. Now, uh, also the cold fronts really make it easy to time your trips. You're fishing a few days ahead of a front or a few days, uh, or excuse me, right up until a front or a few days behind a front is really the best time to fish. And the same holds true for our tropical systems. This time of year, we don't have cold fronts, but we get these tropical systems. This, this year, uh, we haven't had too many, and hopefully that holds true. But as those tropical systems come through, fishing gets really, really good up until that storm comes through. And that really excites the fish. It concentrates the fish. The fish are just like you and I. Uh, they know bad weather's coming. It's not because they watched the news or saw Mike's weather page. It's because they have that lateral line. Um, for example, on these snook, that black line on the side of the snook, that's a lateral line. Every fish has a lateral line. Not every fish as, is as defined as a snook is. Some fish, the lateral line, it's kind of hard to see, but they all have them. And basically what that thing is, is a barometer. That's how they sense movement underwater. It's a, an extension of their eyeballs. So that senses barometric pressure changes. It senses movement in the water around them, and it allows them to sense when bad weather is coming. Bad weather is always a low pressure. A hurricane, tropical system, cold front, they're all low pressure systems. So the fish feel that, that pressure dropping and they know it's time to get up on some structure. So they all come to the structure and hang out and take refuge and group up together and they feed really heavily because they know 
they're not going to be able to feed for a few days during that bad weather. So right ahead of one of those bad weather systems concentrates your fish and makes them easy to catch. Then on the back side of that bad weather system, once waters have calmed down and cleared up, the fish turn back on because they're climbing out. You all remember, those of you who lived here for a while, you remember Hurricane Irma. Like a week and a half, two weeks, we were out of power, things were tough, didn't have AC, and then all of a sudden, you were able to get back to life as normal. And we all went out to dinner and ate out and, 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 and all of a sudden spread our wings, you know? You come out of that cocoon of hurricane uh, just chaos. And it's the same thing for the fish. On that bad weather, there's a bunch of sand, the water gets really mixed up. They don't wanna venture out away from the rock because predators and other issues and they can't feed as well. Once it all calms down and clears up, they come out in force and they really feed well. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, that's what we're kind of looking forward to, the change in the weather, the change in the patterns. We're all looking forward to it cooling down, I'm sure, hopefully. <laughs> But uh, what did you guys want to talk about? Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Offshore and So is it cold through the weather that affects the best So her question is, uh, does it hold true everything we were just talking about inshore uh, as well? In my opinion, yes. Uh, fish feed really well inshore, just like they do offshore. It's more notable, notable in my opinion, offshore, because the fish are under more pressure. Every 33 feet is an atmospheric pressure. So in 99 foot, they're under four atmospheres of pressure. So here we're at 14.7 pounds of pressure pushing down on us, one atmosphere. At 99 feet down, you've got four atmospheres or, or four times the amount of force on your body. So those fish, a little pressure change is much more noticeable that, to them than a snook in four foot of water. So the deeper you go, I think they have more of a fine-tuned innate ability to pick up on those pressure changes. Whereas inshore, it's more, inshore I think, in my opinion, has more to do with salinity level, uh, length of the day, and water temperature. In the cooler months, a cold front comes through, water temps get low. And that forces fish into the upper bays, into shallower areas. They start getting on that dark bay mud to warm up. And uh, they're less concerned about, in the summertime right now, those fish are in deeper water trying to find cooler temperatures. They're hanging out under docks or bridges looking for shade. They're closer to passes where there's higher dissolved oxygen content. So it changes a lot in the winter time. But yes, I think to some extent, the weather changes and patterns we were talking about also have an impact inshore. I just think it's less noticeable. Another question? Yeah, um, say from offshore, inshore to offshore, does the clarity of the water make a difference? In yeah, I think uh, clarity of water makes a huge difference inshore, near shore, or offshore. Uh, what you got to remember though is, especially again offshore, there is different changes. Yesterday I was with my family out at Shell Key. We were in five, six foot of water, but if you walk down the taller guy, as I walked out into deeper water, you could feel cooler temperatures. From my knees to my ankles, it was cold. It was like 75, 78 degrees. But from my knees above, it was like a bathtub. And that's how it is on the beach. And that's called the thermocline. And that's literally two different layers of pressurized water. And that cooler water is heavier, it's more dense, and it sinks to the bottom. The same thing will happen offshore. Sometimes in the summer months, we'll get areas of really cold water and you'll drop down and the fishing might be a little bit tough and you'll reel up and you'll grab your egg sinker and it's cold to the touch. It's like it was sitting in a fridge. And that is not good because the fish generally in that area get a little lethargic and it's a big shock when you swim from 90 degree water and all of a sudden you hit 75, 78 degree water, it can be a little shocking. But it's also in the same effect like a spring, 
there's offshore springs, and those fish are a little bit more aggressive because they're a little cooler. But they're not in shock because they're acclimated to it. They're hanging out in that area. So yes and no. Uh, if, if you're talking top to bottom water clarity, then it would make a big difference. Like inshore, for example, when the water is really, really clear, um, in the winter months, we get really clear water. Uh, typically in the spring, we see really clear water. And that is really, really tough sometimes because the fish get lit, really leader shot. For example, at our dock, fishing for snook in the morning. I love fishing for snook in the summertime at the dock when the overnight's gone, that whole slip is open and there's snook everywhere. But fishing in that dock light, where all the light from the, the boardwalk has attracted a bunch of bait and concentrated snook, if I cast out there with 50 pound tests because I'm fishing right next to a, a piling this big around covered in oysters, if I cast out there 50, 60, 70, or 50, 60, 80 pound test leader, I'm not gonna get a bite. But if I cast out there a 20 pound leader, I'll get bit, but I'm gonna get broke off. And that's the challenge. And so I'll cast that 60 pound leader over here out in the darkness on the edge of the light, and I'll be able to hook up because they can't see the line out in the darkness. And then I'll have a better chance of landing that fish. So that's the difference to me between clear water and, and dirty water. The same thing is, in, is true when you're fishing an oyster bar or a mangrove shoreline. If it's nice, clean, clear water, you gotta lighten up. And also inshore, you have more hook pressure. You have more lines in the water. Those fish see more lures. So you also have to lighten up because of that. But once the water gets murky, you can use heavier tackle. And like, for example, right now, we're getting a lot of rain, inshore water getting murky. And right now, it's even murky offshore because of uh, we've had, what I've been told is we had a, a historic release of fresh water out of the Mississippi River because of all those, we all heard on the news a month ago, uh, Kentucky, Missouri, all those areas were getting like crazy thousand year floods. All that rainwater is now on our doorstep in the Gulf. It, it came down the Mississippi, it came out the Mississippi, got caught in the loop current. The loop current goes uh, clockwise around the Gulf. I had to think about that for a second. It goes clockwise around the Gulf, and so it came out of the Mississippi, got pushed down our way. And now, right now, in 200 foot, 500 foot of water, it looks like John's Pass. It's like dark green. It's not blue out there, which is weird. And that's why, so I've been told by uh, some researchers. So yes, I think water clarity has a big impact. Dirty water, you can get away with using heavier tackle, but inshore where they see a lot more hooks, you still gotta be a little bit conscious. For me, grouper fishing, snapper fishing, especially this time of year when gags are open, I like staying a little heavier than I normally would. And then if the bite is slow, we're not really catching as much as I would like or as fast as I would like, then I drop down. And then you might start fishing, for example, on a 39 hour trip at night, we're targeting mangroves. So normally I'd be fishing 40 pound tests to start. And if it's slow, dropping down to 30. This time of year with gags open, I'll start at 60 pound test. And if I'm able to catch the mangroves consistently and often, I'm gonna stay at 60 pound in case I hook up with the gag I've got a fighting chance. But if I drop down and I'm not getting bit, that's when you're dropping down to 50, 40, maybe even 30. Uh, for those of you in our supporters group, Captain Brian was on a, a supporters video the other day talking about 30 pound test. And that's what he recommends right now because the water's so hot. So uh, August, September, we get really hot water. And it's the same thing inshore with the redfish we talked about on a radio show. Uh, pitching dead bait, dead cut bait underneath the mangroves for redfish. It's the same thing offshore. Water's super hot, they're super lethargic, using big chunks of dead bait, lighter tackle, is producing more bites. But you hook up a big 38 pound, 40 pound gag on light tackle, you've got no shot. So you gotta find the balance on, do you want the bite or do you wanna catch the fish successfully? So a little bit of luck, uh, you'll, you'll be able to land that big gag, but for the most part, you want to try to start heavier and then work your way down if you're not getting the action.
Yes, sir. So if you've got a good spot in 100 foot, you've got good keeper right grouper, and then all of a sudden they're not there, generally it has a lot to do with either A, do you fish down the spot, and then it will take a while for them to come back, or the bait is moved. Red grouper is very, very uh, mobile over an area. In my opinion, I thought they were a lot more mobile than some of the research says they are. Uh, but generally, red, red grouper at night will go out and scavenge. I think they do it during the day a little bit too. Uh, it has a lot to do with the moon phase. Cap Ryan was a commercial fisherman for like 35, a lot of years. Uh, he doesn't like me telling how long. It's all antsy. But he's a very experienced fisherman, and he knows red grouper patterns better than anybody I know. And he will tell you all the time, talk till he's blue in the face, about how red, fit, red grouper will go out and scavenge an area, even into the sand. You'll catch those red groupers sometimes when they got almost a white belly. That's because they were out in the sand looking for shrimp and crabs at night or during the day even. Uh, so red grouper is one of those things that's really hard to really say, this is a really good piece of bottom and I can go out there and catch red grouper consistently because one day they're there and then one day they're not. For example, bait piles. You'll be running along offshore and you'll see this big spike and you're like, whoa, and you slow down. There's not really structure there. It's just a spike on some hard bottom. A lot of times that's like squirrel fish or Tom Tate's or vermilion. And then all of a sudden there's a bunch of big fat red grouper in with them at the bottom. You're able to pull out a couple nice big fat red grouper, but you go there next week, it's going to be gone. They're not going to be there. The really fishing structure is important especially if you're trying to build a, 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 a chart or a list of fishing spots. Fishing structure is important. Potholes, uh, ledges, rock piles, springs, caves. But red grouper is one of those things that like that Swiss cheese bottom. And you really don't know it's Swiss cheese bottom. It's hard to tell other than it's hard bottom, it's flat, and there's always some fuzz on it. It always looks fishy. And that's generally what we call Swiss cheese bottom. Now, have I dove every piece of bottom I call Swiss cheese bottom in my laptop? No, there's a lot of it. But like what Captain Brian does, being as though he used to be a long liner, he would chart areas and he literally will mark areas of sand and areas of hard bottom. So on his computer, he's almost mapped the Gulf of Mexico because he always takes a little bit of a different angle to a fishing spot. You're gonna fish this spot, you might fish that spot in three more months, but the next, and your next trip out there in three months, take a little bit different angle to that spot, and then you're able to catch another little piece of bottom. Nowadays, you can cheat with things like the side scan radar, or side scan sonar, which we're gonna be putting on our boats this year, I'm very excited about, uh, which will help further reach. That way, even if you take a little bit different angle, you're gonna be able to see 50 yards on either side of the vessel and you're really not gonna miss things. And watching your bottom machine as you approach areas like that and finding where that bait moved to, that's where your red grouper went. Maybe 150 yards from that spot is another little pothole. That's where the bait's sitting today and that's where all the red grouper went to. So you never really know. To answer your question, it could be the next day you go back out there and there's a bunch more red grouper there because the bait came back or the bait could be gone for a couple weeks or it could be a month or a hurricane could come through and it could totally cover the spot. And that happens a lot. A nice big swarm comes rolling over. All the areas we fish are hard limestone bottom surrounded by sand. A pretty good size cold, or a pretty good size, even a cold front. Pretty good size cold front, pretty good size hurricane, tropical storm, whatever. If you get a 15 foot wave, it can have almost 40 feet, 50 feet down, 60 feet down it can stir up a lot of sand. And so you get 15, 16, 18 foot waves for a long extended period of time in 60 to 100 foot of water, it can totally uncover new spots and cover old spots that were once very productive. Uh, so it can definitely mess up fishing a little bit, but it can also make it entertaining because you're finding new stuff. So you've got to always keep your eyes out for sure. 
So to answer your question, there's no tell. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So the question was, in, in cooler months, it's better fishing by the numbers, but when you, would you recommend starting for someone with less experience? For me, I think fishing in the summertime can be really easy sometimes. Fishing in the wintertime can be really easy. Again, there's not one better time that I would recommend starting. Just get out there. Just get started. And then over time, you'll learn what you like and what you don't like. Uh, a, a joke I made at the last seminar that really resonated with me is I get calls a lot from people. I talk to a lot of people on the phone. And I had a call one day with this guy, and we're talking. I'm like, yeah, yeah, fishing's going really good right now. Oh, what do you mean fishing's going really good? I'm a local. I know fishing's not good in the summertime. I only fish in the wintertime. And then, like, the very next day, another person on the phone, oh, I don't fish in the Winter time. I only fish in the summertime. I know the fishing's only good in the summertime. I'm like, what? And it, it was so comical to me sitting there hearing the, the differing opinions and so passionately differing opinions. But some people have a, 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 a strong opinion one way or another. The summer to me, you have more aggressive snapper fishing offshore. They're in higher concentrations. They're a lot easier to find. You can get them chummed up to the surface. The summertime is calmer weather overall. Generally, it's really, really nice and calm through a, a longer period in the summertime. And we have a lot of pelagics around that kind of hang out all summer. Uh, if you get out deep enough, you can get some really, really big fish in the summertime. In the wintertime, the bigger fish come in a little bit closer as far as near shore and offshore fishing. But the wintertime can get really tricky because you have a lot of bad weather. You can have four weeks of two foot or less in the summer. To find a six day period in the winter when it's really cool out, a period of three days of nice weather is something to celebrate. Because you, these cold fronts, they start coming every two, three, four, five days. And the cold front, when it rips through, the weather's really bad when it's coming through. And it could be pretty rough res residually for three or four or five days behind a strong front. So you're losing these big periods. So it becomes really difficult to plan trips in the cooler months because of those cold fronts. You gotta schedule a time off of work, right? You gotta tell the boss man three weeks ahead of time, I'm going fishing this weekend, take me off the schedule. You gotta line up things for your kids. Uh, and then all of a sudden, a cold front comes through and blows out the weekend. And it can be frustrating. Whereas this time of year, plan a trip nine out of 10 times, unless there's a hurricane, you're, you're good. We don't run into as much bad weather in the summertime. So one's not better than the other. They're just different. But overall, summertime makes it really easy to plan trips because nicer weather for longer periods. Yes? I was on one of your pretty nice trips. The guy caught a fish tag. Yeah. And it was tagged in the swamp. Yeah. Can you explain that? Are all fish tags? So uh, he was talking about a, a, a fish he saw come in that was tagged. So we work with FWC to do a lot of cooperative research projects. We work with the University of Florida. We work with the uh, University of Miami, uh, Sea Grant, uh, Texas, uh, a and uh, Mississippi State University. You name uh, the coastal university, we've done a cooperative research project with them over the years. To, and most of them are designed and kind of written around a specific species. For example, right now what's going on is there's an amberjack the tagging program, a cobia tagging program. They're always tagging red snapper, gag grouper, red grouper. They're now doing a, uh, if you've been on a 39 hour recently, you see the, the, the college age kids grabbing the five gallon buckets of mangrove snapper carcasses. They're doing a mangrove snapper reproduction study right now. So there's a lot of uh, research centered around fisheries and one of the easiest re methods of research for fishery science is called fishery dependent science. So there's two ways that they can kind of study the health of a fishery is fisheries independent science and fisheries dependent science. Fisheries independent science is the gold grail and if you have a long data set of fisheries independent science, that's considered the best possible indice 
or kind of measuring device to measure the health of the fishery. But it's very expensive to get because that means scientists went out on scientific vessels to do a scientific study that was designed in such a way statistically that it's basically impenetrable because all these fisheries science projects all have to be third-party peer-reviewed before they're input into a stock assessment. And let me tell you, those third-party peer reviews, their whole job is to come in and be like, I don't like that, I don't like that, no, that's got to go, that's got to go, throw that away. And that's what they do to a lot of these scientific projects. And a lot of good work by a lot of great people can't be input into surveys because they're not long data sets or they don't have statistically sound uh, research methods. So fisheries independent science is the gold grail, but it's very expensive, it's very costly, and you have to have a long time series, meaning you gotta do that multiple years in a row, decades in a row. There's not many decade long projects like that. Fisheries dependent science is the guy at the boat ramp with the clipboard, what did you catch today? Or anything that depends on you as an angler to provide science. So what you're talking about is tagging. That's called a tag capture recapture project. Scientist comes out on a boat with us. You catch an undersized gag or an out of season gag. Scientist takes it, vents it, tags it, sends it back. A few months later, that fish is caught with the tag hanging out of it. Scientist gets alerted because we fill out a little postcard where we caught it, the tag number, a little bit about the angler and the tackle used. We send it out. They send back generally to the angler, like a guy back there is wearing a shirt. I see it. It's a, I, I see you, man. Uh, you, they'll send you a t-shirt and they'll send you like a little note of your fish grew X amount of inches and it moved X amount of miles. And basically what it gives scientists is really helpful information about growth rates, migration patterns, uh, spatial uh, kind of understandings, and then also uh, the biggest thing beneficial to you guys is mortality numbers. A big question is, what's this card mortality? You catch an out of season red snapper and throw it back, how many of those die? What's the discard mortality? Meaning if you discard the fish, how many of them die? And that tag recapture study is a huge benefit to you as anglers because if we could prove that a majority of fish that we catch and release live because we're using things like a descending device or we're using things like a venting tool and using proper handling techniques, then we can prove that we're not killing as many fish out of season. And that means we have better access when season is open. A lot of what we get, what we faced back in the day with Red Snapper was seasons kept getting shorter and shorter because states were out of compliance, but also if the fish is closed 11 months out of the year, we're still fishing, right? We're still out there fishing. We're just not catching that fish because we can't keep it. But you still run into it, especially as a fishery gets healthier. You catch more and more of them. But it's not open, you gotta throw it back. That's called a regulatory discard. You are regulated to discard that fish. But a certain percentage of them die. That's what they're looking at on the South Atlantic right now. The problem has gotten so bad over there, the feds are literally saying, well, we're just gonna close it completely. You won't even be able to go out there and fish. You're not allowed to catch a release. They're talking about completely closing South Atlantic federal waters. Gives me the chills, that's a scary precedent. That, that's not the goal. So everybody that's take a deep good. breath, but it's still scary. They do that over there, that sets a dangerous precedent. Luckily, there's a lot of good people working to try to stop that from happening, but it's a scary precedent to set. So all that to say, you catch a fish that's tagged for the love of good things, holy, make sure you turn in that tag number because that's really beneficial science for you in the long run, it proves that that fish live. So the more tag returns that happen, the better the information the scientists get. So to answer your question, you see a tag fish because it's a scientific study. Well, um, what, how do you determine the information in? I mean, you, you have to fish back and then you just tag so, them. So, great question, how do you turn the information in? Uh, if you're fishing on a charter boat or a party boat like ours, we have the cards because the scientists are always out. If you don't have the cards, you're out with the buddy, you're like, oh, I remember that. I remember from the seminar. We gotta turn that tag number in. 
take a picture of the fish, uh, ask the captain a general area of where you're fishing, and then you can just call FWRI or Florida Wildlife Research Institute. They have a hotline number. You tell them why you're calling. They're used to it. People call all the time. We call because we lose all of our postcards. And uh, you can just tell them over the phone. Or you can contact me and I can get you in contact with those people as well. Question in the back? Yes. Yeah. Good, good, great point is if you catch a fish with a tag in it, don't remove the tag. Unless you kill the fish, then you can remove the tag and keep it until you get your t-shirt. Then it's kind of a souvenir too. But if you're going to throw the fish back, do not remove the tag. Leave the tag in the fish because then that fish can be recaptured a second time and provide even more information. Great point. I should have mentioned that as well. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so descending device versus a venting tool they sell. These descending devices right over there. Uh, this is called a sequelizer. And you set the depth and uh, you clamp this on the lip of the fish. And then once it goes down to a certain depth, it'll actually auto open. Fish swims away. Uh, what, what, why you need to use a device like that is called barotrauma. And we talked earlier about pressure differences. Long story short, if you catch a fish at 100 foot, it's got four atmospheres of pressure on it. We talked about that earlier. And then you reel it up really fast. Now it's only got one atmosphere of pressure on it. For those of you who dive, you know what I'm alluding to. If you're not a diver, you go down to 100 foot and you fill a balloon up, a normal party balloon. By the time you make it to the surface at zero feet from 100 foot, that balloon you filled up at 100 foot would have quadrupled in size and probably exploded. The same thing happens to the internal organs of that fish you just brought up. That swim bladder, all fish have a swim bladder. That's what keeps them level in the water column. It expands and expands and expands. And most of the time, when you catch a fish out of depth, it'll have something protruding from its mouth. And a lot of un un inexperienced anglers think, poke that, pierce it, it'll let the pressure escape, they'll be able to swim back down. Yes, they can swim back down, but that wasn't their swim bladder poking out of their mouth. That was their stomach. And now you put a hole in their stomach lining and they're going to be able to swim back down, but they're going to die a very slow, excruciating death. So don't do that. So to answer your question, sir, what do I recommend? For 99% of people, a descending device is best because it's super easy, requires zero experience. Clip it on the lip. All you do is close it on the lip of the fish and set it to the right depth. It's going to go down and it's going to auto release when it gets to depth. The fish is going to swim off just fine and just healthy. You'll be able to catch them another day. There's actually scientific studies. A fish was caught in 480 foot, and descended and caught eight months later in 600 foot and had grown like 10 pounds. So these work really, really well. Venting works really, really well if done properly. It takes a lot of experience to know where to vent them. And also, even once you're experienced, you can sometimes slip and go too deep. Now you're per piercing other organs. And even if you're super experienced, super careful, you're still putting a hole in that fish to vent them. A descending device doesn't require putting another hole in the fish. It's super easy to do. So 99% of people should learn how to use descending device or this devices. On our boats, we teach people how to vent. And the reason why is, because there's a lot of people on the boat and the catch rate is hopefully very high. So when catch rates are high, that's when descending devices kind of become less effective. Because if we've got 10 descending devices and 40 people and we're catching fish fast, that means you're gonna have to wait to descend your fish because someone else is already using it to descend, to descend their fish. And then a fish being at, out of water at the surface, every second is exponentially more barrel trauma. So you want to get them up quick, off the hook quick, vented or descended as quick as possible. So venting tools work really well in our application because we have a lot of people fishing and we're hopefully catching fish really fast. So venting works really well in that application when properly done with the proper tools in the proper place. So to answer your question, they both work. <laughs> with an asterisk. <laughs> 
Yes, ma'am. So a lot of what I see when people are fishing is they catch it, they take it off, and they throw it back. That's not good. So what she said is when she what she sees when she's out fishing, she'll see people take catch it, take it off the hook, and throw it back. If you see that and the fish gets hits the water and it goes back down, that's great. As long as it's going back down. But once you're fishing in deeper water, around about 80 to 120 foot of water, there's a certain threshold in which that fish you throw back will just float away. And it won't be able to go back down. And that is a fish that has had so much barotrauma it can't return to bottom. So that's when you either need to vent or to send a fish. And the depth at which that starts happening is dictated by water temperature. Hotter water is less dense, it holds less oxygen, so barotrauma happens shallower. So in the summertime, 80 foot, 90 foot, you could potentially have to vent or descend fish. In the wintertime, when water is more dense and it has more oxygen, you might not need to vent fish even if you're in 120 foot. So it kind of depends on the depth, time of year, and also the species of fish. Things like hogfish or juvenile red grouper, they're really fragile and they experience barotrauma more frequently, even in shallower waters. So it kind of just takes time. But a good rule of thumb is if you throw a fish in the water and watch it float away, don't return another fish unless you're venting or descending. But always keep in mind, the faster you get it up, the faster you get it off the hook, the quicker you get it back into the water, the higher the chance, exponentially higher the chance that fish is gonna be able to swim away and live another day. So really focus on trying to learn how to get them up quick and off the hook quick and back in the water quick. And also, keep in mind guys, if you go to uh, return them right, so the word return, E-M, right, return, return them right, dot org, uh, you can actually uh, take a little 10, 15 minute course. It's a pretty cool kind of educational course Again, it only takes 10 or 15 minutes. And then uh, when you finish that, you input your address, and they'll send you a free $75 descending device with a three pound weight. And nowadays with the price of lead, that's like $10 a lead. So they'll send you a fully rigged descending device. They'll actually send you two of them with a weight. Again, return, return them right. Return em right .org. Check it out, get your free device. Also, a good pair of de-hookers, because if you set it on a descending device and set them down, if you took your needle nose pliers and you were digging in that fish's mouth with these needle nose pliers way up in their gill rakers and you're twisting it around, the fish is dead anyway. So really want to make sure you get them up quick, off the hook quick, back in the water quickly, but Get them off the hook quick with a pair of descending, or a pair of really good de-hookers, they're gonna have a much higher chance of living. So I really, really highly encourage anybody, whether you're fishing inshore uh, for trout, redfish, snook, or you're fishing 100 miles offshore for grouper, get you a good pair of de-hookers. And the best pair of de-hookers that is in existence today are the ones uh, that have unequal bevels and that will turn the hook upside down for you. So this uh, slow pitch jig is going to pretend to be my fish. So I'm going to hook this fish onto my hook. So now I've got my fish dangling, just reeled it up real quick and now I'm going to get it off the hook quick. All I'm going to do is hook my uh, hooker on and pull the rig together. And I did it fast to show you guys how quick it can happen. It's really simple. You just grab the, the hook of that de-hooker around the back of the hook, and then you hold the line at a 45 degree angle away from the de-hooker, and you pull these two handles together. And watch what happens to the hook when I do that. So the hook's straight up and down. I grab the back of the hook, and then turn that line down, and that hook is now upside down. The fish falls right off that hook. So whether I'm fishing for trout inshore, uh, or 100 miles offshore for grouper, making sure you have a good pair of de-hookers is gonna uh, exponentially decrease the number or the amount of time you're spending messing with the hooks. Again, just running the, the hook of that de-hooker down the back of the hook, 
and then pulling the handles together and then turning that line. Fish will fall right off the hook every time. And that saves me a lot of time, which then in turn increases the likelihood that fish will survive and I get more fishing time. The more fishing time I have, the more fish I'm gonna catch, right? So having a good pair of D hookers is essential. So get yourself a good pair of D hookers Please don't ever use a pair of pliers to de-hook the fish. The only time you need a pair of pliers is for split rings when you're slow pitch jigging or if you're trying to bend out a hook or you're trying to put new hooks on a lure, in my opinion. You don't ever need a pair of pliers to go fishing. That's not a very, uh, it's still a highly uh, debated issue in some circles, but and to me there's a right way and a wrong way. And the right way is making sure you're taking the best possible care of that fish, and that's by properly using a good pair of D hookers. Would that be good for sharks? Hang on one second, I'm gonna to go to someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Yep. Yeah. So his question was, after these big rains, does the salinity change in the water have a big effect on the fish? And yes, they definitely do. Again, fresh or inshore fishing is not my specialty, but what I've noticed over the years is like, for example, John's Pass, we have Long Bayou right, right a stone's throw away from us. And when we get a really, really big rain and Long Bayou is flushing a lot of water on a hard outbound, We've had alligators come up to the end of the dock. That's a lot of fresh water flushing. And I've seen an alligator gar cruising underneath our dock before. So we get really big pushes of fresh water. And what that'll do a lot of times is that'll flush a lot of bait out. A lot of bait flushing excites a lot of fish. But most of our saltwater inshore species, redfish, trout, uh, uh, snook, they're all pretty well in tune to fresh water and they can survive in fresh water. I mean, go look at the fish tank in Bass Pro right now. There's freshwater bass and there's saltwater redfish in there. And that's because there's a very low salinity level, enough the bass can survive, but also the redfish too. And trout and snook can also handle some pretty fresh water as well. <coughs> it kind of gets brackish. Uh, what that does specifically to each specific species, I don't know, but in my experience, after a hard rain, we get a big flush of a lot of bait. A lot of bait gets pushed into passes. We get a lot of crabs flushing, so the tarpon get excited. Tarpon are one of those species like redfish that can survive in almost fresh water. They can survive in fresh water, tarpon can. So tarpon get excited, redfish get excited. We see a big push of bait and it definitely helps kind of get fish feeding because the water moves more. Remember, inshore fishing, it's all about the tide and moving water. So when you get a bunch of rain, what does that do? It runs off the middle of the state, comes down to the coastline, and it creates bigger moving tides. More moving water means more feeding fish. So in general, big rains push a lot of bait, a lot of food, and it gets those fish excited. So your question earlier was about, do the D hookers help with sharks? Catfish, sharks are never an issue anymore if you have a good pair of D hookers. Because you don't ever, ever have to take, touch the fish ever again. And these D hookers are uh, very hard to get. Uh, we actually manufactured our own with the company. So these are like gold. So these, I protect these more closely than a lot of my personal possessions. So. Joking about stealing them is not fun. <laughs> no, 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 stingrays, stingrays. Uh, stingrays too, yes, yes, stingrays, uh, virtually anything because uh, remember, you don't have to touch the fish anymore. So with these the hookers, for example, if I catch a keeper fish, I turn around and I shake it right into the fish box. If I, keep, I catch a fish that's not a keeper, I shake it over the side of the boat. Because not only does it save me time uh, not messing with the fish, but what happens when you're on a, a long trip and you catch five or six mangrove snapper? The front of your rod starts to get slimy. And I'm OCD, it drives me nuts. And then you go to catch a fish and what happens? You start cranking and your reel slips because your rod's all slimy. With that thing, you're not touching fish anymore. So the only thing that's getting your hand slimy is the bait. So it cuts down on a lot of that slippage 
on your rod and you don't miss as many fish as well. So definitely recommend it. Yes, sir. Catfish are like the cockroaches of inshore fishing. Atomic bombs don't bother cat or roaches or catfish. Uh, they just, they really are unaffected by anything. A catfish? Oh, 100%. So, Perfect example, this morning I was out snook fishing before the boat came in, and um, the snook were being really finicky, and the same example I talked about earlier, they were all busting bait in the light. Outside of the light, they weren't really feeding, but I didn't have my fishing pole, I was using a hand line. And you really can't go lighter than 60 pound for a hand line, because if you do, it'll cut you really, really bad. So I was using 60 pound tests, and I couldn't get them to feed. They were just watching my shrimp swim by them, uh, so it sunk down and I caught a catfish and I was like dang it reeled in the catfish got it off the hook but immediately I cast it back out another shrimp and I'm looking at my hand line and there's these huge sections of like glowing line and that was from the catfish slime I brought it up and it twisted around some of the line and it, that catfish slime is so thick it takes that clear monofilament makes it very opaque. So if you catch a couple, really if you catch fish, period, you gotta change out leaders. Especially offshore, you get a really good spot, you catch five or six fish, if the boat moves, cut that leader off and retie a new one. You can use the same hooks probably, but use new mono or new fluorocarbon. Because every time you catch a fish, that mono or fluorocarbon stretches. And if it stretches a few times, what does a rubber band do? The rubber band stretches five or six times, you start to see those little hairs, and you start to see the fibers of the rubber band, and it starts to become much less pretty and worn out, and then eventually it'll snap because it's overstressed, and the same thing will happen to your line. Over time, your line will be less clear and be, will be much more apt to cut or snap because it's been stressed out. I'll get to you in one second. She's been waiting a minute. Yep. So if uh, her question was on when the hooking a fish, when they swallow the fish or the hook, does it work? Yes, because what do we all, what a lot of people have needle nose pliers. Well, I need my pliers. What if they swallow the hook? This thing is eight inches long. This is gonna work a lot better to get that hook out of its throat than this thing. It's not as quick. As I showed you the example, if it's on its lip, they just fall right off because you can angle the line away from this and it makes that hook turn upside down. Whereas if it's down its throat, it's a little bit more tricky, but you can still get that hook out of the fish's throat a lot easier with this. And does, does, you said that um, all the flood water was coming down to the Mississippi. Has it really affected your fishing out there? So uh, we were talking earlier about that big freshwater outflow from the Mississippi. She's asking if it uh, affected our fishing offshore. I haven't really seen a big effect on our bottom fishing. It has affected the pelagic fish. We're not really seeing the pelagic fish out there in 160, 200 foot that we normally do. But this weekend we fished a little bit shallower in a little different area. We found clearer water and that's where the pelagics were. They were really active. So it's moving the fish around. Yes, sir. A steel leader over a mono leader? Yeah. No. No, I've only ever used monofilament or fluorocarbon leader. The only time I would use a steel leader ever is if I was fishing for sharks, uh, and a really big shark at that. If I wanted to catch a eight foot shark, I'd be using a steel leader. But even small sharks, super leader shy. You gotta remember where we are. The, the Tampa Bay area is a killer fishery, incredible fisheries, one of my favorite places to fish. And I'm a little biased, of course, but I still strongly <laughs> hold to that. Even fishing places like the Pacific, the uh, Caribbean quite a bit. I really like our fishery in our area. We can just catch so many different things and we have such a large area to fish. But we've got a lot of people here a lot of people and we
We got a lot of people out fishing, especially since COVID. It's almost doubled or tripled the number of boats you see out there. So they see a lot of hooks. That means they see a lot of leaders. They see a lot of baits. They see a lot of different techniques. So they get very leader shy. So you got to remember that when you're out there. You got to lighten up, especially in the summertime when there are even more people on the water. There's even more pressure. So steel leaders really don't work that well because the fish see the lead and they're not going to bite. It not holds true for tackle too. You can see here, this is what we fish with 99% 90, 90, of the time is as simple as possible. A slip egg sinker, a swivel, and a pair of hooks, or sometimes just a single hook. If I'm using a live bait, I'm single hook rigging. If I'm using a dead bait, I'm using a double snell rig. Uh, and that is as minimal uh, terminal tackle as possible. You see these rigs that they make up at Walmart, or I'm sure Bats Pro has them over there on the shelf, what they call ready rigs that are all tied up. They've got crimps, and they've got beads, and they've got this, and they've got that. Don't work. Or they don't work as well because they have more tackle. And unfortunately, people starting out, those are easy to grab, right? Because it's already made up. All you have to do is tie it on one time and it's ready to fish. So a lot of people gravitate towards that and they go out in the skyway and sit there for 10 hours and don't catch anything. They get frustrated and then they don't fish again. And that's why is because they're not using technically the best tackle. Using a, a slip lead with minimal weight uh, or minimal uh, terminal tackle, minimal weight, and then using instead of the cut squid you found in the bait aisle in a Walmart, uh, going and getting some live shrimp from a tackle shop and using minimal weight, minimal tackle, you're gonna have a much ch better chance at catching a more quality fish that's very leader shy. And I saw eight different rigs from Walmart today, you know? So it really comes down to your approach. You gotta always think like a fish. It sounds silly, but it's true. Think like a fish. When you guys are eating, do you wanna go to a restaurant? You want that food to look pretty on your plate? It's attractive, right? Presentation means something. You come out and it's like, oh, the steak is perfectly seasoned. It's got the grill marks on it. The plate's all pretty. The chef has some garnish on the plate. I'm not gonna eat that garnish. What's that for? But it makes it look pretty. Same thing for fish. That lure going down the side, if it's got a, a split ring and a swivel and a snap swivel in front of it, that going by compared to this leader with that Rapala loop knot and floral carbon that's 10 pound test in front of it, what's gonna look more appetizing? Which presentation is better? You gotta think like a fish. Remember, presentation is important. Making sure your bait looks natural and is presented well is gonna increase the chance of getting that really good fish to bite. We are unfortunately out of time, but I will hang out after. If you guys have some more questions, you're more than welcome to come up and chat with me one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll be happy to hang out for a while and answer questions. Uh, also, keep in mind, tonight, guys, and every Sunday night, we have our live show right on the Hubbard's Marina Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Trovo, Twitch pages. Uh, if you watch on the Hubbard's Marina Facebook page, you get a chance to win free trips tonight as well. We give away over $800 in free trips every Sunday night during that live show. It's only an hour long and we do the same thing. We kind of show you photos of what we've been catching over the past week, talk about what's coming up next week, and then we answer your questions. You can text your questions in live to the show. We try to rip through some questions and answer your questions during that live show too. So if you have some more questions that you don't want to hang out after and ask, or you don't really, maybe you've thought of something, but you didn't feel comfortable raising your hand and asking it, that's the beauty of the live show. You can text it in anonymously, and then we can answer your question on the show. So uh, definitely check out the live stream show. If you don't win one of the show, or one of the trips we're giving away now, you can win some tonight. We do that every Sunday night right on the Hubbard's Marina Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all those different pages, okay guys? Uh, 8.30 p.m. every Sunday night. We have our radio shows every Saturday morning, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's also streamed live on our Facebook page, too. So check out our, our uh, weekly radio show. Check out our weekly live show. And hopefully we'll get a chance to see you out there on the water at Hubbard's Marina. Thank you for coming tonight.